Compared to a planet, asteroids may be small, but they contain big insights about our solar system. To explore these fascinating objects, NASA is embarking on two new missions, Lucy, a probe that will visit a record-breaking number of asteroids, and Psyche, an orbiter destined to explore a bizarre, metal-rich world. These missions, among others, could help unravel the origins of life on Earth and protect our civilization from a cataclysmic asteroid impact. I'm so excited today to be talking to Bill Bodke. He is the uh, director of the Department of Space Studies at Southwest Research Institute and a member of several different teams, um, science teams for NASA missions looking at asteroids. You have a very wide expertise about asteroids. Um, you study impacts on Earth and there's these exploratory missions you're part of. Um, and then you also uh, do a lot of work about future hazards to, to humans as well. Um, from impacts. What, what sparked your curiosity initially about asteroids? The reason I'm in this field is the Apollo program, right? When I was a little kid, Apollo was, uh, you know, they were sending the first humans to the moon. And, you know, how exciting is that? You're a little kid and you're getting to see this and you're getting to see humans explore brand new worlds. And I always thought, boy, wouldn't that be great to be able to like do that and explore these places no one's ever gone before. But I have horrible eyesight, so there was never any thought of me being an astronaut. So I thought, well, I'll do, the, I'll do something that may even be better, which is to try to do the science and learn the stories of these worlds. Oh, I'm not exploring, I'm exploring a different set of rocky worlds. These worlds haven't been seen by anybody. When most people think about asteroids and asteroid impacts, it's that one famous one that uh, wiped out the dinosaurs that immediately pops to mind. It, it captures the imagination, uh, the Chicxulub impactor. Uh, 66 million years ago, and you've done an a, enormous amount of research on this. What are some of the cool questions still remaining about this crazy event that uh, totally reshaped the biological landscape on Earth? The Chicxulub impact and all the associated extinction events that go with that mm -hmm. are just an endlessly fascinating topic. And because the dinosaurs came to an end at that time, there's a hot debate on this where some people think it's asteroids and some people think it's only volcanism. But what if it's some kind of interesting combination of the two? First of all is exactly like how big was the asteroid that created the extinction event? Um, we have an estimate for how big it was based on um, some of the debris that happened during the impact. There's like little, la there's layers that date back to the time of when the impact took place. And you can look for traces of rare, of, of essentially rare metals like iridium and the rest and say something about maybe how big the asteroid was. But they're not always as diagnostic as you would want. So was the asteroid, um, you know, larger than let's say six miles across? Was it much larger than six miles across? Or was it smaller than that? Second interesting area I think with Chicxulub, which I think is still really intriguing is that there's some evidence that when the asteroid hit the earth that at the same time it may have caused surges in volcanism across uh, across the planet there's evidence you know, on the ocean floor for this there's evidence in different um other lines of volcanic evidence for this and so like when a very large impact hits the earth what does it actually do to the Earth? Chicxulub isn't just like a one-off event, right? It was, a, it was a singular event, an amazingly um, catastrophic event for life on Earth. But our, everything we've learned about the dynamics of asteroids and how asteroids get here and the rest suggests that these events should happen every so often, every few, you know, maybe hundreds of millions of years. I'd love if you could elaborate a little bit on this recent study that you and your colleagues did where you took a NASA supercomputer and like actually modeled over 100,000 asteroid orbits over the course of a huge period of time. What's happening is that there's a set of asteroids that are on the same paths as the Earth. They cross Earth's path and we run into them from time to time. But something has to replenish those asteroids. Basically, those asteroids that can hit the Earth can't have been there for billions of years. They just, they're dynamically, they're too short-lived. So what we think what happens is that they're replenished by mechanisms in the asteroid belt. And so what we did is we looked at all of the asteroids that we think were large enough to maybe have created the Chicxulub impact. The way to think about this, it's a little bit like a, like a, a pinball machine or a pachinko machine. If you play one ball, the ball goes in crazy places and you don't know where it's gonna go. But if you play a million balls, statistically you find out, okay, they're much more likely to go on this side of the machine or that side of the machine. And the same thing happens in the asteroid belt. So what we did is we tracked the orbits of asteroids escaping the main belt, and we created over 130,000 model asteroids. We think of the Chicxulub impactor obviously as a destroyer of life. It, it, it you know, uh, totally obliterated so many ecosystems. But um, what can it tell us sort of about the role in a of asteroids in 
perhaps helping to seed uh, life for four billion years ish ago. What can happen in some cases is that life sort of fills all the available niches and then it may, may stop evolving. Okay, it may not have a need to evolve anymore because it's basically been successful and it's filled different places. So you can imagine asteroids coming in and wiping out those niches and then forcing evolution to sort of redo things again. And mm -hmm. so Im impacts over time may actually allow life to gradually become more complex by consistently providing sort of a perturbation to how life evolves. There's some um, reason to think that a lot of the water we have on the Earth and the nature of Earth's atmosphere, a lot of that may have been delivered by impacting asteroids very early on when the Earth was forming. So in some sense, we may actually be, you know, asteroids are ancestors in lots of different ways. I love that idea of them as ancestors. We kind of owe our existence to that to that asteroid. I really wanted to talk about NeoSurveyor, this mm -hmm. this planned NASA mission that is uh, that you're working, that you're part of the science team on. So uh, NeoSurveyor is stands for Near Earth Object Surveyor, and it's it's a it's a telescope which uh, is going to be put into space. It looks at asteroids in the infrared, where actually the background stars and the rest don't have as much of a signature. So it's much easier to pick out asteroids, right? And it's ultimately going to search the skies for hazardous bodies. Um, we've been working on this for oh, over a decade or so. NASA seems to have adopted um, this mission. So it looks like it's going to happen. And we think we found about 90, per, about over 90% of, let's say the asteroids about larger than about a half mile across or so. Those are the ones that can cause global devastation, we think. But there's a lot of asteroids still left that can produce local damage or regional damage. So this corresponds to roughly finding about 90% of the objects larger than about 140 meters in size. But after five years, we should have identified most of the threatening asteroids that exist out there. And then we can see whether any of these asteroids are likely to have an impact trajectory with the Earth. Yeah, and I was interested too in just the position of the of the space telescope. Like it will be in the Sun-Earth Lagrange one point. Um, where where is that, and why is that such a good spot to be putting this uh, this surveyor? Imagine you have a planet, and you have the Sun, and the planet is orbiting the Sun. And then you put like another body, like an asteroid or something else there, right? So Lagrange points are the places where the gravitational forces combined with their sort of motion around the sun are more or less equal. So the L1 position is one of those really neat positions that exists between the sun and the earth. Okay, so if we put a space, so we like to put telescopes and other things in these regions because they don't need a lot of fuel for station keeping. We can put a spacecraft there and then it can look back at, at the Earth, and it, but also we can look at a lot of the objects that sort of travel near Earth's path. Okay, And so those are legions where we're very likely to find hazardous asteroids. You're also part of the science team of a, of a mission that is about to launch as we're recording this. It may have already launched um, when this posts. Um, the Lucy mission, NASA's Lucy mission. There are two Lagrange points, they call L4 and L5. The regions very close to those points are stable. And it turns out they're filled with asteroids, okay, both positions. And so we call them the Trojan asteroids. And their origin is completely unknown. They're one of the mm -hmm. last sort of subpopulations of bodies in the inter in the solar system that we haven't investigated yet. The, the Lucy spacecraft is actually named after after like the, the, the ancestor of our kind of human, uh, the Lucy hominid. Now, that Lucy skeleton tells us a lot about the origins of our species. The Trojans are telling us about the origins of our solar system. So the two are connected. Okay, so the Lucy mission's job is to go look at these objects. We think these bodies are sort of, in a sense, like fossils that these asteroids are telling us about the conditions that existed back when the solar system was forming. So we want to go visit these objects and see what they are, see what they're like. We're going to launch from Earth on October 16th. We're going to fly out away from the Earth for about a year and then come back a year later. We're going to go out to the Trojans and we're going to see four different Trojans and then fly all the way back to the Earth. And then we're going to come back out again and visit a really interesting Trojan, which is uh, two objects that are larger than 100 kilometers that are orbit orbiting one another. Does there have to be gravity assists or things like that that go on to be able to put them on the right path? We have an engine Lucy, which is, you know, so we're going we're gonna to fire to get onto this particular trajectory. And then it's going to take us out to the Trojans. All right, but, and then we'll do a little bit of course correcting, but mostly it's 
we're going out in sort of a long trajectory, which then takes us back to the Earth again. One of the other things I really love about Lucy is that um, much like the Voyager missions, it's got a plaque that has some, you know, thoughts and inspirational kind of time capsule on it that, from, from prominent writers and, and thinkers on Earth. Mm. We're ultimately searching for the origins of our solar system, but also the origins of ourselves and maybe addressing some of the big questions that people have, like, like essentially, how did we get here? Okay, mm -hmm. is you know, so, so we asked a lot of these prominent writers and thinkers to sort of give us their thoughts on on these kind of profound and interesting issues, and they came up with an incredible collection of poems and and phrases. And yeah. then I also wanted to discuss this other up upcoming mission um, that you're part of science team for, the uh, Psyche mission. Okay, so Psyche is a really interesting asteroid that lives in the middle of the asteroid belt. So there's some thinking that Psyche might actually be an exposed core from some body that was broke apart. There are probably protoplanets that were bashing one another early in solar system history. And some of their remnants, some of the things that were extracted from their deep insides may have become asteroids and may now be sitting in the asteroid belt. So our hope is Psyche might be one of these objects. And so if we go visit it, it's actually telling us about a part of our, I mean, about an aspect of planet formation that's almost impossible to get to. So we've sent spacecraft to ice, icy bodies. We've sent spacecraft to rocky bodies. Mm -hmm. But we've never actually sent a spacecraft to a, a body which may be entirely metal, or at least is incredibly metal rich. Why aren't all the asteroids rocky or icy? Why are some so metal rich? The fact that it is metal rich, it really has sparked a lot of conversation about the idea of, of, of resource mining, of space mining. Um, and uh, I wonder what your read on that is, if that's a feasible thing in the near future. There's all sorts of entrepreneurs and even governments you know, getting involved with uh, space resources or thinking about it. Mining resources and bringing them back to the earth is a very expensive proposition. But if you were going to build something in space, that would maybe be the best use of space resources. Ultimately, what you want to be able to do is build something that allows you to have a space-based economy. And the space-based economy may involve energy, it might involve exploration of other worlds, it might have involved tourism. So you only do all these things if it's going to help people on the earth. Given the very kind of diverse research goals that are emerging from all of these different types of missions that you're on, uh, I just wonder if you could speak like on a broad level, what are some of the big questions about asteroids that you would like to see the next generation of missions tackle? Precisely how we went from a bunch of gas and dust to actually asteroid-like bodies is still not well understood. And there are certain places where objects have been created where they retain a lot of their initial signatures from when that formation event took place. So like visiting these objects and learning how these things formed in the first place would be very exciting. The second thing, and this is maybe a more uh, even, even more profound thought, is that there's a lot of thinking right now that our, our system of plants that we had didn't always have um, the, same, the same look it has today. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's reason to think that very early on in solar system history, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune were on very different orbits. Okay, And then beyond Neptune, there was this huge population of comet-like objects. Imagine a population that maybe had a thousand Plutos out there and all the small objects associated with it. We think that system may have existed. And then early on in solar system history, basically uh, an instability happened and it caused planets to migrate it caused all these small body populations to be devastated by interactions with the giant planets. Everything kind of went crazy for a time. So one of the big things I'd like to get at is what can we do using, using the investigation of small bodies to test this model, to really see, is this how our planetary system formed? Is there a particular dedicated, uh, you know, spot in the solar system that you would want to send the next mission? You probably want to go to the outermost reaches of our solar system because there the objects have been sort of kept in cold storage since the earliest times of solar system history. The only thing with going out there is that it takes a long time to go out there and it's, you know, it's, it's a fair amount of work. So hopefully we'll get a mission at some point on that, but you know, maybe it'll be my kids that are doing, they're looking at that, not me. So it could be if we visit the certain bodies that we can identify that we think started their lives in very different places and investigate them, we can learn more about how they got there and the processes they went through and ultimately the dynamical process, which allowed the asteroid belt to sort of be a collection zone of all these really interesting characters. That's so cool. You know, it, the planets tend to, to uh, grab all the attention, but you've made such a good case for these minor bodies and these small asteroids. Especially if you see something new. So, you know, seeing something new is always exciting. That's what 
that's what most of people in our field are, are here for, right? Is that every now and then you get this, this chance to see a world you, no one's ever seen before. And how fun is that?